Hello everybody, uh, Chaplain Bob here. Listen, this is going to be an introduction, uh, but it's going to be a study on Ezekiel 14. I think it's very, very applicable to today. It's an older video, but I'm reposting it for because it, it's five years old. All right, take care. Hello, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This Bible study is going to be on Ezekiel 14. And there are three people who figure prominently in this book. And that's Noah, Daniel, and Job. Ezekiel is a book of judgment upon the children of Israel for disobedience. And you'll have pastors out there that'll tell you, oh, pff, don't bother reading the Old Testament. That's only for the Jews. Well, you know what? Don't listen to them. God, it says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Ignore their different dispensations well, there are, I am dispensational, the new and the old. The new dispensation and the old dispensation, also called covenant or testament. There's two of them. The first one was the dispensation of law given by Moses. And the new dispensation was one of grace given to us by Jesus, who is the Christ, by his blood. Okay. All right. Ezekiel 14, verse 1. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. Uh, just so you know it, Ezekiel was a prophet. Okay. Verse 2. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man. Now, I don't know if you know it, but Jesus called himself the Son of man. A few times. Verse 3, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of them at all? Oh, I'm sorry. Should I be inquired of at all by them? In other words, they put idols in their heart. Okay. In other words, they put other things that were more important. Politicians, to them, power. Um, to a harlot, sex. To somebody that's greedy, money. Okay. So they put they put things up in their hearts that were more important than God. The Lord says, um, Jesus said to love the Lord with all your soul, all your mind, and all your heart. That was the first and great commandment, and I'm paraphrasing. If you don't put the Lord first in your heart, okay, you've got a problem. So they put up idols in their heart and a stumbling block of their iniquity. Iniquity is sin and evil. Okay? So basically they're saying, these people have put other things in their heart ahead of me, and a stumbling block of evil before their face. And should I even answer these people? Okay? That's basically, that's the Bob... Uh, commentary there. Verse 4. Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that set up, setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I the Lord will answer him that cometh according to the multitudes 
the multitude of his idols. In other words, he's going to answer he's going to answer you with what you want to hear. Don't believe that? Hold on. Listen to this carefully. Verse 5. That I may take take the house of Israel in their own heart because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Now, if you talk about an estranged husband and wife, it's, you know, a husband and wife that are separated on their way to divorce. Okay. Verse 16. Therefore say I unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, repent, repent, repent and turn yourself, yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For every one of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me, and sep setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniqu iniquity before his face, and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I the Lord will answer him by myself. And I will set my face against that man and will make him a sign and a proverb and will cut him off from the midst of my people and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Okay, Ezekiel 14.9. Listen to this carefully. And if the prophet be deceived when he hath spoken a thing, I the Lord have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand upon him, and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. Do you realize, if you put a bunch of idols in your heart before the Lord, he'll actually deceive you? Think about that the next time you watch TBN and the 700 Prophets of Baal Club. Verse 10, and they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. That the house of Israel may go no more astray from me, neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people and I may be their God, saith the Lord. And the word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Listen to this carefully, verse 13. This is America coming. Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it, and will break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. Do you know that the entire state of California is in drought? When they talk about breaking the staff of the bread, they're talking about no crops, and will send famine upon it. The entire state of California, or is it Californication? Californicate? I don't know. You know, San Francisco, um, all the fruit, fruits, flakes, and nuts, the Granola State, you know, that's all California. Diane Feinstein, um, you know, every weird thing comes out of California. Yes, California supplies uh, about 50% of the winter vegetables of the United States. Okay. Uh, back in the 70s, I had read where it said that if California had been its own country, it would have been in the top 10 richest countries in the world because of all the, uh, the food exports. I mean, they grow almonds, grapes, um, broccoli. I mean, you know, all kinds of stuff they grow. California's in drought. Farmers are freaking out. 
And of course, the uh, powers that be, they're more worried about giving water to the illegal aliens than they are the farmers, you know. Um, it might be prudent to put a, a few things away uh, as far as food goes. As far as I know, it's not illegal to store food. Of course, that could change. They call it anti-hoarding laws. But um, California is severe, severe drought, and so is Texas. You know? Now, for those of you that think, oh, this only applies to Israel. That this doesn't apply to us. We're we're New Testament Christians. Well, let's take a look at something. All right, let's look in the uh, Second Thessalonians. You know, this is why people hate Paul, and they want to deny all his writings and everything. And you know what? Let them. Paul had a lot of warnings for the church. And if they want to do away with his warnings, that's fine. You know what? The Bible, the uh, Lord says that a, <clears throat> I'm sorry, excuse me. Paul said that a heretic after the second and third admonition, reject. And to uh, admonish means to, uh, you know, you rebuke them, you warn them. You know, an admonishment is like a strong warning. So you give them a couple warnings, two, three warnings, and then that's it. Leave them. Let them go. All right, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10. Does the Lord change his uh, plans? Let's see. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So they were deceived with unrighteousness, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. <clears throat> Do you know what a delusion is? It's something that's false, but you believe is true. God's going to send them the strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You know, there's a lot of people, you, they do altar calls and ask the people to come up and give them a 30 second sinner's prayer and then tell them, oh, you're saved, brother, and hallelujah. Now you're once saved, always saved, and, and you can live any way you want, and the Lord's going to save you. Think about this. You want to live in unrighteousness? Yeah. Yeah, the Lord will actually deceive the wicked. Okay? And this side of, this side of uh, paradise, we're not going to be able to live in sinless perfection. No way. We're still in this corruptible flesh body. But we can strive to be as holy. The Lord said, be holy for I am holy, and I might have that backwards, but he might have said, well, I, I believe that's what he said, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> We're to be as, try to be, strive to be holy like Christ was holy when he walked on the earth. All right, so this is the New Testament. You know what? Um, the Lord's, Lord doesn't change. He's going to send people that live in unrighteousness, a strong delusion. All right, people, Ezekiel 14, 13 again. Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it and will break the staff of the bread thereof and will send famine upon it 
and will cut off man and beast from it. Okay, so is is uh, USA is this land sinning against the Lord? Um, how many states are uh, sanctioning sodomite marriages now? Okay, I don't even know anymore. Uh, it was like ten. Um, I mean, it's just this land is so wicked. I mean, I can't hardly believe what it was. You know, I was a kid in the '60s, but I used to read the newspaper um, because my um, teacher said that I was a poor reader in um, the first few grades in elementary school, primary school, whatever you call it now. So the teacher encouraged my family to buy me things that I enjoyed to read. So, you know, they started buying me comic books, you know, Batman, Superman, um, Green Lantern, Flash, whatever. Um, and I started reading the newspaper. So I used to read the stories and stuff. I mean, here it is. I'm in elementary school, you know. And um, by the time I had graduated from elementary school, sixth grade, I was reading at freshman college level. So not to be bragging, but, you know, it's practice. That's what it is. But compared to the stories of today with what they were then, we never had school shootings then. You know, we never had, we had a few crazy people back then, but not like it is now. So, the land, the USA, is sinning against the Lord. So the Lord's going to stretch out his hand. He's going to break the staff of the bread. He's going to send famine upon it. And he's going to cut off, kill man and beast. And when he talks about beast, we're talking about like cattle. Okay? Oh, and by the way, Texas is in drought too. And that's cattle country. So... California is in drought. Texas is in drought. We're in trouble. And there's no sign of repentance. All right, verse 14. Ezekiel 14, 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, it's talking about the land that's sinning, okay, um, when you're talking, when you're talking about a land that sins, and, and you know it's not the ground, we're talking about the people in the land. Okay. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord. Verse fifteen. If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land and they spoil it so that it be desolate, that no man may pass through because of the beasts. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters. They only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Wow. You know, not even their sons and daughters will, will survive. Only, you know, I mean, Noah was the flood. Daniel was um, when the Babylonians took uh, Judah. And Job, if you've never read that book, you should read it. It's probably the oldest book in the Bible. Okay. Ezekiel 17. Or if I bring a sword upon that land... Sword means war. Or if I bring a sword upon that land and say, Sword, go through the land so that I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord, God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, that they only shall be delivered themselves. Or if I send a pestilence into that land, that's disease. And by the way, when you have a famine and there's no food, disease always follows. And I said always, because you're malnourished. Your body doesn't have anything to 
fight off disease. Or if I send a pestilence into that land and pour out my fury upon it in blood. To cut off from it man and beast. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. You know, when the Lord says the same thing two or three times, he's just not repeating himself. Okay? He's making a point. Um, you know, when I went to college, I noticed that when the professor said something more than once, uh, it was probably going to be on the test, it was important, and I'd write it down and make sure I studied it later and knew it. And sure enough, it usually was on the test. You know, something obscure that you only heard one time generally wasn't, you know, wasn't on the test. So, but here it is. <laughs> And you know what? Uh, the Bible's sort of kind of a textbook, and this is kind of a test. But, you know, we're not going to get grades, A, B, C, D, uh, I mean, A, B, C, D, F. Uh, there's only pass and fail. It's either you pass, go, collect 200 bucks, and get a mansion, or fail, um, you go to the other place, you know. All right, verse 21. For thus saith the Lord, God. How much more when I send my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword and the famine and the noisome beast and the pestilence, to cut off from it man and beast. Yet behold, therein shall be a remnant that shall be brought forth, both sons and daughters. Behold, they shall come forth unto you, and ye shall see their way and their doings, and ye shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem, even concerning all that I have brought upon it. And they shall comfort you when ye see their ways and their doings, and ye shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, saith the Lord. So, in other words, um, you don't want to make the Lord angry, okay? And all these people running around saying, Oh, Jerusalem's such a holy city. Well, yeah, to the Lord it is, but when you got people inside of it doing... Um, do you know Israel, uh, Jerusalem just had its 10th um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transsexual, um, gay pride parade? Um not too long ago. Think the Lord's happy about that? Mm, I don't think so. And that's some of the least of the things that are bad. So, what was it that made Daniel, Noah, and Job where the Lord loved him so much that if he sent judgment upon the world or judgment upon the land that he would spare them. All right, let's start with Noah. What was so good about Noah? Genesis 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. So Noah was a just man. He was perfect in his generations. That's his genealogy. That's his bloodline. I have a playlist on what happened in um, the, the flood of Noah. The angels that sinned. Genesis 6. The sons of God. Um, people, modern people. The modern church world has turned it into a fairy tale, okay? But it's not a fairy tale, okay? Uh, Genesis 6, 13. 
And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, and the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Okay? So, evidently violence is something the Lord doesn't like. All right, Genesis 6, 22. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Genesis 7, 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. So Noah was righteous in the eyes of the Lord compared to, you know, the, the rest of the evil in the world. Uh, Genesis 7, 5. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. So he was obedient. Okay? He was obedient. Well, if you turn to Hebrews 11.7, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Hmm. 1 Peter 3.20 Which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a-preparing, where in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. You know, do you realize that Noah and his family were actually saved by the water? Okay. So evidently, they were in danger, and the Lord saved eight souls by water. All right. Uh, let's see. Second Peter two five. And the Paul haters hate this verse, uh, 2 Peter also. They say it, it doesn't belong in the Bible. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. I think that pretty much sums it up. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. He obeyed and he walked with God. Okay? So when there's a famine and pestilence and war in the land, and it says the Lord says he's going to bring um, noisome beasts through the land, those four judgments, um, we had better learn some lessons from Noah. I think it would be a very smart idea. All right, let's take a look at the life of Job. Job, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Eschewed means avoiding and hating. Okay, so he feared God and hated and avoided evil. Okay. Uh, let's see. In Job in verse 5, Job 1, 5. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, 
It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So here it is, Job's offering sacrifices to the Lord on behalf of his family. Um, I have a feeling that Job's daughters were far more righteous than the sons. Because it seems like the sons were always doing um, wicked stuff. I don't know. Maybe. Verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Okay. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? In other words, doesn't he fear? Uh, does he fear you for nothing? You know, and then Satan was complaining. Um, if you keep reading this, you know, you'll keep reading it. Um, he, Satan makes a bet with the Lord. You know, oh, take away everything that you've given him. He'll curse you to your face. You know, because uh, the Lord had put a hedge of protection about Job to where Satan couldn't go in. You know, that's what a fence is. That's what a, a walled city was. It was like a hedge. Uh, it was protection. Matter of fact, I did an entire uh, study on it. Uh, the hedge. Okay? And that's why it's so important to be in God's will. Because when you are out of God's will, God will take away the hedge. And Satan will come in and destroy. Okay? So, basically, the Lord made a bet with, well, Satan and the Lord made a bet. Um, Satan could touch everything that Job had except his life. Okay? And, basically, um, you know, his, uh, his livestock was taken, his sons are killed, um, you know, family dies. He has boils. He's, you know, really sick. And his wife even said, curse God and die. And Job, I think, basically said to her, you know, don't be a foolish woman. Okay? In all this, Job was faithful. Uh, he wasn't perfect. Okay, and Job had some people that came over and told him, oh, well, you've, you've sinned. Uh, that's why God's uh, allowing you to be punished. You sinned. You did something bad. And, uh, you know, you could read it. You could read the whole book, you know. But sometimes bad things happen to good people. Not because we sin, but just things happen. You know, sometimes the Lord allows us to be tested. You know, if, if the Lord wants you in a ministry and you've got a good job and you don't want to leave your good job, sometimes the Lord will make that job go away to have you do things that he wants you to do. Look at Jonah. Or, or um, I'm sorry. Yeah, Jonah and the whale. You know, the Lord said to go one way, and he went the other. So the Lord brought a storm, and, well, you know the rest of the story. In Job 1, in verse 22, In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly, Okay. Um, in Job 2, 3, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him? 
without cause. Okay? And then you can keep reading and, you know, Lord um, Satan smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his feet unto his crown. You know, that's so he had sores from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. And if you got boils, you know, all over your body, you, you, you can't walk, you can't do anything. You can't even lay down and sleep. Okay? And um, in verse 10, you know, the, his wife had mentioned, uh, you know, curse God and die. And Job says, but he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Um, so, you know, we're to be faithful in all our trials. You know, the early Christians were murdered for their faith. You know, Stephen. And what does the modern church teach? Oh, the pre-trib rapture. The pre-trib rapture. We're the bride of Christ. God would never allow us, never allow us to go through any trouble. He doesn't want to beat up his bride before she comes to him. God's not a wife beater. And people that believe in post-trib, they're a bunch of wife. They, they charge God with being a wife beater. Yeah. Fools. I, the Lord, will deceive that prophet and destroy him from among the people of Israel. The Lord will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Believe once saved, always saved. Say a 30-second sinner's prayer and then live in unrighteousness and be positive you're going to heaven. i tell you what, I'd rather live in righteousness than unrighteousness and be deceived by the Lord. In the book of James, verse chapter 5, verse 11, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Okay? So, you know, we're supposed to have what they call the patience of Job. You know, so there's, um, each believer has their strong points and their weak points. So, all right, now let's take a look at Daniel. Daniel's another interesting character. Now, Daniel's an interesting character because he was among the royalty of Judah when the Lord pronounced judgment upon Jerusalem and allowed the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, to take uh, Judah. And the king of Babylon wanted, you know, some of the royalty of Judah and Jerusalem in his household. Um, you know, it's always ha better, it's always good to keep the uh, well-educated people around, okay? Um, so Daniel was taken captive, kept alive, okay? And if you read Daniel 1, verse 7, Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, Okay, so if this guy's the prince of the eunuchs, Daniel was made a eunuch. And, um, you know, he was, uh, let's just say his male, members, male, male member was cut off that he couldn't reproduce. Okay, David did, uh, Daniel didn't have any children. Okay, because when a king had a harem, he didn't want his um, servants playing with his harem. So that's how they used to deal with that problem in the old days. 
Did Daniel complain? No. He didn't. He didn't complain. Matter of fact, he accepted the punishment and still gave blessings and praise to the Lord. Verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Okay? Daniel didn't want to probably eat pork and get drunk. Okay? He wanted to keep himself pure, his body pure, before the Lord. All right? So Daniel was very conscious, okay, about trying to be pleasing to the Lord. Turn to Daniel 2, verse 19. Then was a secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Okay? So, I mean, obviously, Daniel doesn't have the power to bless the Lord. The Lord has the power to bless us, but we don't have the power to bless him. But we can sing his blessing, you know, his, um, his blessings from our lips. Okay? Verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and might are his. Okay? Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and might are his. In Daniel 6, verse 5, uh, there was a bunch of people trying to make a conspiracy against Daniel. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Okay? They knew they couldn't uh, accuse him of the king of breaking, you know, being an evildoer. So they had to find something um, to accuse him against the, the Bible law, against what the king was saying to do. Okay? Remember, um, for example, the three Hebrew children, the three he Hebrew young men that uh, wouldn't worship the golden image of Nebuchadnezzar, and they were cast into the furnace, okay? They wouldn't worship the idol. Well, that's what they've got to do here with Daniel. they got to find something that he'll honor God before he'll honor men, and then get the king mad enough to, you know, kill Daniel, okay? And you could read on, and Daniel, you know, was thrown in the lion's den, okay? And, of course, the Lord spared him. All right, turn to Daniel um, 6 and verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So he had done it before, and he was doing it now. He prayed three times a day. Huh, how's that for a, a, um, a lesson to be learned? Okay, I mean, I got to admit, I don't, I don't pray three times a day. Uh, maybe sometimes, usually once. You know, I need to take my own advice here, right? All right. Um... Check this out. Daniel 10, verse 11. Um, this, is a, this is an angel speaking to Daniel. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, or beloved, understand, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent, and when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, 
Fear not, Daniel, from, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. So here it is, Daniel is, was greatly beloved. Okay? And Daniel prayed for understanding of God's word. He didn't pray for riches. Okay? Um, all right. So here it is. The Lord sent an angel to give Daniel some understanding. All right. Daniel 10, 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Okay? We're not talking about an earthly prince stopping an angel. You know, when we talk about the prince of Persia, we're talking about a, a high-ranking angel. A fallen angel. Okay, let's continue. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remain there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. Okay? So, evidently... Alright, let's skip again. 19. And said, O man greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the princes of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. The scripture of truth. We ain't talking about an NIV Bible, by the way. And there is none that, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. And we're talking about Michael, the archangel. And uh, we're not, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Christadelphians, those idiots think that Jesus is Michael, the archangel. Uh, he's not. But, you know. All right, so we should emulate Noah, Job, and Daniel. And we could be spared when the Lord says, when the Lord sends his four plagues upon the land. Famine, pestilence, noisome beasts. And you wonder, are these noisome beasts on four legs or are they on two legs? Um, and war. And, uh, you know, when you send war, uh, the farmers are killed or fighting and they're not planting crops, and then you have famine, and then, and then disease follows. So it all kinds of adds up. All right, well, this is Chaplain Bob. I hope you learned something. And um, I did. I always learn something when I do these studies. We should be like Noah. We should be like Daniel. We should be like Job. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor belong to Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor belong to him and him alone. 
and the Father, and the Holy Spirit. All one God, world without end. Amen.